Welcome to Winter Hill, and I want to thank Chris Bach and the people at Winter Hill for hosting this really nice event uh, today. Uh, it's really helpful uh, to uh, have this special kind of event at a wonderful place like this. So we're really thankful that they opened it up. Uh, it's a little difficult logistically, but I hope you can hear in the way back. We do have mics so that you can hear the panelists, which is far more important than, than hearing me. Um, and I want to thank uh, our technical people. We have Greg Gunder. He's going to be videotaping. Uh, Ross Corsair is going to be taking uh, still photos, and uh, we are audio taping it thanks to Rick Gundy, uh, Gedney. And so uh, I want to thank, too, Susan Landstreet for putting all the details together, which is, is really nice. Um, and most of all, I want to thank you uh, for coming. Uh, it's, it's very important now that phillipstown.info and the paper are now a not-for-profit what we would call a reader-supported or member-supported um, operation. And um, we'll talk a little more about the state of journalism and newspapers with our esteemed panelists uh, shortly. But your support just means so much to us. Um, I wanted to acknowledge the, the chairman of the phillipstown.info and the paper board, Chris Bachelman, there in the back. And and importantly, she got one of our panelists here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, other uh, board members here are Fred Osborne, uh, Ralph Arditi, and Irv. Uh, Flynn. Flynn? <laughs> no, I, I was looking to find him first to make sure that, that he was here. Um, I'd like to um, introduce the panelists. The, what we're going to try to do today is, as I say, get into the subject of the future of journalism in a way, uh, but do it in a, in a personal way and do it through the lens of what many would consider the world's flagship newspaper, the New York Times. Um, and we are just so lucky to have these award-winning former journalists with us here um, in, in Winter Hill. Um, we're going to ask them uh, to share uh, their personal experiences um, a little bit from the past a lot from the present, and, and then uh, kind of have fun with uh, the future. And uh, we'll open it up then to, uh, to the floor. Uh, so that's kind of how we're going to do it. Uh, I, the biographies of these three amazing uh, gentlemen could go on and on and on. I've just tried to consolidate it down do a few notes that so you'll have some sense of, of, of who they are and, and why it's just such a great treat to have them here. Uh, to my far left is, is Stuart Elliott, a long, a long time advertising uh, columnist of, of the New York Times and uh, often bringing levity and light uh, to this uh, sometimes overly serious subject of hidden persuaders and, and, and so on. Uh, Stuart uh, is a product of the Bedell School of Journalism. Uh, he has both his bachelor's and his uh, master's from, from there. Um, I got my start in advertising in Chicago at the Leah Burnett Company, and I was telling Stuart I, I was lucky to teach a, a course at the Northwestern Downtown Program on consumer psychology. Uh, which was great. <coughs> Stuart's written not only for the New York Times, but for USA Today, Advertising Age, the Detroit Free <laughs> Press, the Times Union, 
Uh, he's also a television star. He's not limited mm -hmm. to a single medium. Uh, he appears live a lot on panels and speeches and so on, but he's been on Nightline, he's been on 2020, uh, and uh, he has a, a blog, and uh, he's now doing a, an email letter for the New York Times called In Advertising. Um, and so he uh, also has co-hosted with Robert Osborne on, on the Turner Classic Movies. Discussions about movies about advertising and, and business and marketing. Uh, and uh, Stuart's going to go first, but I, I want to uh, next introduce next to Stuart. I think most of you in the room uh, need no introduction to Andy Revkin. He's, he's not only famous in the world of environment and journalism, but he's famous here in Garrison and, and Cold Spring, <laughs> partly because he's a songwriter and musician and just all around good neighbor to everybody. Um, Andy right now is a senior fellow at, at, at Pace University, um, but he's been a, a mainstay in the, in the field of the environment. One of the early uh, environmental writers, reporters, uh, he has his biology degree from Brown and his uh, master's from Columbia School uh, of Journalism, as does our other, our third panelist, <coughs> Floyd Norris. And, and I don't <coughs> want Stuart to feel we're ganging up on him, but I happen to be mm. teaching at the Columbia Business School, so it's sort of Columbia, 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 and then... <laughs> Big Ten. <laughs> but but he, he'll hold up. His, 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 his. Uh, Andy's published uh, books on the Amazon, rainforest, global warming, uh, the Arctic. Uh, he did one of the early uh, uh, coverage uh, actually in the Arctic, on the Arctic, uh, and the Arctic guys. He's been a senior editor at Discover, a writer for the LA Times, a writer for Science Digest, and of course, the New York Times, and, and he's had uh, a Guggenheim Fellowship. So, Andy, thanks for being on the panel. Stuart, welcome to Garrison uh, as a visitor. And our third panelist uh, is Floyd Norris. Um, Floyd divides his time between here and um, that small town uh, south of here on, on, on the water. Um, he uh, has been at the Times for 26 years. Uh, he has been the chief financial correspondent and an and assistant business editor. Um, he has had a, a column, the high and low finance and, and off the charts. Um, previously was the trader columnist at, at Barron's, um, and he worked for the Associated Press and, and UPI. Um, <clears throat> Floyd was a fellow at, at Columbia, um, and he also got his MBA from Columbia, which is why he's a business writer and writes on economics and, and finance. Um, and he was given the Loeb Award from UCLA, and he's been given awards from the Society of American uh, Business Editors and Writers and the New York Financial Writers Association. So they're all prominent, highly awarded, and just brilliant people. <laughs> and what we thought we would do is start out a little bit talking about the past, and most importantly, their personal past with journalism and, and the New York Times. We'll then move, after each has done that, to sort of the present, what's been going on at the Times from their vantage point over the last four or five years, and then, as I said, we'll end up with sort of a look ahead. Uh, Stewart's agreed to be the kickoff uh, and to talk a little bit about the past. Hi, everybody. Uh, can you all hear me? Uh, the, uh, my career has been entirely in journalism. I started uh, what seems to be like 15 minutes ago, but I looked at the calendar. It was over 40 years ago, my first job 
out of the Medill School of Journalism was at a uh, paper in Rochester, New York, no longer in existence, called the Times Union. As you, you will find if you spend your career in journalism these days that increasingly you will be telling people about places you used to work that there aren't places there anymore. Uh, all that's left are the clippings and the memories, but uh, no physical, uh, no physical uh, trace of the uh, newspapers or magazines uh, or legacy media companies that you might have worked at. Uh, from there, I followed a course uh, not unfamiliar to people in the journalism business. Uh, I was there, started out covering the suburbs and worked my way up. When I left, I was the TV radio columnist. Uh, from there, I went to the Detroit Free Press uh, and covered the uh, advertising and marketing and retail uh, industries for the business section there. This was when uh, Detroit was just uh, a, a bit battered from a couple of oil embargoes, if you all remember those. But uh, compared to what was to come for poor Detroit, it was, uh, in retrospect, uh, kind of a peak in terms of... Uh, uh, the population, the size of the auto industry, and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, I spent three years there, wanted to get back to New York. I'm from originally from New York. Uh, went to uh, Advertising Age uh, and spent uh, several years there uh, as a reporter and an editor. I covered the magazine industry, stories like the relaunch of uh, Vanity Fair and some of the other uh, big stories that uh, affected the uh, print industry in the 1980s. Uh, from there, I went to USA Today, covering advertising and marketing there, but from a very uh, consumer point of view. Uh, I was involved in the startup of uh, the USA Today, the annual feature that continues to this day called the Super Bowl Ad Meter. You all <laughs> familiar with that? That was the uh, uh, part of what has turned the Super Bowl every year into this extravaganza of advertising as well as of football. Uh, the uh, USA Today uh, had its uh, polling department uh, scientifically sample a cross-section of American consumers, get them in a room, have them watch the Super Bowl, and completely ignore the game and spin little dials to rate the commercials that happened, that were shown during the game. And that was part of the uh, uh, what led to the uh, Super Bowl commercials becoming as big a phenomenon as they, uh, as they have been. Uh, I was at USA Today for three years, and then I was uh, uh, recruited for the New York Times, uh, where I joined in 1991 uh, to take over the advertising column, which uh, ran in the uh, business section of the paper Monday through Friday. Uh, the column had started in 1935 and had gone through a succession of... Uh, of writers and uh, reporters, uh, most notably a gentleman named Phil Doherty, who had handled it for uh, 22 years. I was there from uh, 1991 until this past December, when I was among the august group of people, including Floyd, who uh, left en masse as uh, part of a buyout offer that we were offered. Uh, during the course of my time at the Times, and I guess we'll get into this, in addition to writing the advertising column for the print edition. I also started writing for the website when in, uh, original content uh, started going up online. I also wrote a uh, weekly email newsletter uh, called In Advertising that went out uh, as an email newsletter product and then also wound up on the website. Uh, contributed to the Media Decoder blog online when the New York Times had a strategy of doing a lot of blogs on different vertical subjects, uh, wrote for that, and uh, also at one point was delivering a uh, daily advertising report on WQXR radio uh, when the New York Times owned WQXR. Uh, and as I said, I was at the Times until three months ago, uh, packed up my boxes and left, and uh, here I am, so thank you. <laughs> Great, Stuart, thanks. Andy, you want to... Sure. Can you, can I, can you guys in the back, do you, do you want to see? I'll, I'll stand up just so you can see me. All right. Um, now your wife can see you? She, she moved to the front. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I kind of, I came to the New York Times so three, uh, four years after I came to Garrison, um, which was 19, I came up here from Brooklyn in 1991. I cut my teeth in, the, in journalism in the early 80s onward, 
in magazines. So I kind of had this re reverse trajectory. I started out in the most leisurely form of journalism where you kind of got to go somewhere, interview a bunch of, interview a bunch of people about something and actually think, and then, and then turn that into a, an article that had a beginning, a middle, and an end, you know, had structure. And, and then, um, and I wrote, uh, I already had written a couple of books by the time I came to the New York Times, so that was the reverse order. But I needed a job. Uh, I was, I'd gone through a divorce and other things, and um, so in mid, the mid-90s, I was living up here, and uh, someone at the Times found my resume from, I had submitted it a year or so earlier, Suzanne Daly uh, found my resume, and she's, uh, she, they, so she set the interview thing in motion, and I started here in 1995, uh, April of 1995, uh, covering the region. There hadn't been an, a regional environmental beat, but uh, Mike Weinrip and, and I, he was the deputy metro editor for regional coverage, came up with the idea of looking at the environment around New York City, around the whole region as a, as a beat. And I started out in 95 writing a lot about the water supply for New York City, uh, and which was also for parts of Westchester. Big questions about balancing development around the reservoirs with, with, um, with uh, the need, to, the EPA was threatening the city with an order to have to spend 10, six or $10 billion building a filtration plant. And it was a fantastic microcosm of this bigger story I've been writing about for decades, which is how do we manage a finite planet with the fewest regrets, even as we advance our economy. Um, and New York City started working with the communities around the reservoirs to say, well, let's cut the pollution at the source, and then we don't have to worry about sticking a big filter on the end of the pipe. And it was a very innovative project. And that, that New York City plan for the water supply under Pataki at that time um, had become a model that cities like Rio and, and Brazil now are looking at, too. So, so it's, it's actually it was one of the archetypal uh, questions of the environment was being hashed out right here. And I wrote about the Hudson River and PCBs, and uh, uh, there's I have two different pictures of me on the Hudson River with a, with a sturgeon. One was 1996 or so with a baby sturgeon, and I was a baby <laughs> reporter. And then uh, several years ago, I was out again with a crew netting mature Atlantic sturgeon on the river for, for the blog that I write for the New York Times, uh, and the fish was seven feet long. Um, and it's just an amazing, again, you look around here, there's so many great stories. So I grew up, my first time's experience was writing about the region. And then uh, by 2000, I, I was back to writing about things I had been writing about in the magazine world, uh, global warming, um, global issues, um, along with the big bad things. Anything that happened that was big and bad and complicated and involved science or technology, I was thrown into that too. And the first one like that was 1996, the crash of Flight 800 off of Long Island. Uh, as Lisa, my wife, knows, we were, we were courting and decided to get married around the, right around the time that Flight 800 crashed. My, my life was hijacked. That was the first time anyone who's worked for the Times in a reportorial uh, mode knows that your life is vulnerable to being hijacked at any moment. It's like being a firefighter or anyone else who, when the buzzer buzzes, and so there was jokes when I was living uh, at the Sheridan... Uh, Smithtown Sheraton, where the NTSB and the FBI and everybody were all camped out there. Was it a terrorism attack? Was it a mechanical failure? Uh, and there was the, uh, the press officer for, for the NTSB, the safety board. She was joking, hey, why don't you just have your wedding out here? <laughs> you know? uh, we didn't, didn't end up. But, um, uh, but you kind of, uh, we had it right here. Um, the Times is more than just a job. It's like it can, it's really a part of your life. And uh, even if you're, if you're married to the Times, you know that. So, um, so then came this interesting period. I was in the newsroom in 1999 when there was this big celebration of we passed a billion dollars in advertising revenue that year. And they were handing out, do you remember, do you, they had this billion dollar candy bar that printed up. And that was when money was so flush that you could kind of create props. Like they were handing out, I think there's a candy bar called the million dollar candy bar. They, hand, they were handing out billion dollar candy bars. And it was like, hey, hey, look at us, you know. And then, of course, a year or two later, they built this building. And then, of course, well, we'll talk more about what happened after that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so we've all lived, you know, we all lived through this amazing juncture where, and then I remember some speech Salzberger gave about, uh, you know, we don't know yet if this is a secular change or a blip, you know, in terms of, like, the, the curve of the stuff that Stuart wrote about, uh, you know, Ad revenue going like this after we, that billion we've, dollars. We've figured that one out though. Yeah, the billion. <laughs> yeah, right. It was a real change, and so and then I went to the North Pole as you heard in nineteen in two thousand three, and that was my moment for me. For that was a moment for me to really understand the value of web communication as well as writing for the printed story. If I had been there ten years earlier, I would have gone there with a pencil and, and a pad 
and maybe a camera, and I would have taken a, done a lot of reporting, and I would have come back to the newsroom and then filed a piece because there was no way to do it. But I, you know, I filed stories and photos from the sea ice at the North Pole, and there was a very enterprising editor at that time uh, on, the, on the desk. I can't remember her name. She said, hey, let's do a reader forum. Like, you're on the North Pole sea ice, Andy, with these scientists. Let's, get, let's put a note on the homepage of the paper. This is 2003. It's a while ago. Uh, saying, Andrew Revkin's on the sea ice at the North Pole, he has questions, he send in questions. And I was doing a live chat with readers, and that's what got me convinced that my job had really fundamentally changed. It was no longer to go out and report a story, it was to, to report the process of reporting the story, too. In other words, to sort of uh, lift the veil a little bit. The veil's going to be lifted anyway, so why not kind of make that part of what you do? And then I, the blog grew out of that. I, I went back to the Arctic two more times. Each time I filed not just stories, but video, uh, slideshows, uh, you name it. And, and, and 2007, I started Dot .earth as a news project, and, and I kept with it. When I took my buyout in 2009, I was in the class of 2009, <laughs> uh, leaving the paper. And, uh, but I keep doing the blog now. I moved to the opinion side of the paper in, in 2010. Uh, so even as I'm teaching at Pace University, now I still write almost every day for the Times, and I have a piece that just is up right now on the future of uh, salamanders. They're poised to be invaded by a fungus that's already devastated Europeans. European salamanders, it's coming here if we don't, if the government doesn't do something about it. So, so I'm still, you know, every day I'm inquiring about the same questions. I'm just doing it only on the website most of the time. And it's uh, always an adventure, knowing, not knowing what's going to come next. So that's kind of a thumbnail for me. Great, Andy. And uh, speaking of local environment and uh, issues and politics, we're happy to have Sandy Galef here in the front row, a representative in Albany. That's great. Floyd, can you tell your story? Yeah, I, I, um, I, Andy, listening to you talk, I, and you talked about, which I had not been aware of, the efforts to control water pollution at the source. I mean, this is government doing something right. <laughs> um, With a gun to its head. <laughs> well, because you of know, money. We're, 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 let's not be yeah, too... Yeah critical. Um, <coughs> thank you all for coming. I spent 26 years at the New York Times, as you heard. Before that, I was at Barron's. And before that, I was a political journalist who eventually became a Senate press secretary and got completely sick of politics <laughs> and had to find something else to do and, and chose business. Went back to school, got an MBA, and I loved it. Um, it's At Barron's, I was a stock market columnist. And hearing Andy talk about um, the, the glory days and the, and the candy bar. Um, on Wall Street, there is, a, there is a common saying that if the company is building a new headquarters, short it. <laughs> <laughs> and I knew that. <laughs> I even joked about it. Did I sell my time stock? I did not. <laughs> um, the, um, Neither did I. Um, <laughs> Neither did I. <laughs> So, you know, so much for judgment. Um, Hear no evil, see no evil. <laughs> no, nothing. It's, the Times has been through many changes. The current, um, and, you know, since the glorious day of 99, 2000, when they were just minting money and spending it in wonderful ways, at least if you got to spend it, um, there's been a lot of effort to figure out how to handle this. It, and I think, I think they're making some progress now. And I'm, 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 I'll discuss, if you want, a little later about what they are doing and what they've tried and, and not been as successful at. The, in journalism, it is now standard to talk about it as, you know, this incredible reversal and failure but there is a sense in which that's not true. Um, the New York Times is today read by more people than ever before. It is read by orders of magnitude more than read it 20 years ago. And what we have to do is find a way to monetize that. And I think we're going to find that out. Um, charging for electronics, you know, the tradition started that you didn't charge for, electro for electronic, you know, for what was then on the web and then other things. It was a stupid tradition. Um, the web must always be free, people would say. And I'd say, well, you know, do you want to work for free? Um, eventually, we are charging 
we're going to have to charge more. The strategies they're pursuing now, I think, um, they tried to have a number of little products. And some of them succeeded. I'm told the cooking app is a wonderful success. I wouldn't know anything about that. <laughs> um, some of them were not very successful. Basically, though, it remains a publication that, in my highly prejudiced opinion, is unequaled. Um, it was also my opinion before I joined the staff, for whatever that's worth. But, and the precedent that I see that has made me optimistic when many weren't, many of you may remember, especially if you lived outside the New York area, the national edition of the Times, which over time spread to the point where you could buy the New York Times same day in almost every city in this country. And that was rising to a peak in the good old days of the 90s and all that. And then after that, as business turned south, we began to raise the cost of the paper. And, you know, what was once a, you know, a quarter or two, you know, is now $2.50. And when, when we did that each time, the New York circulation would always suffer. There were some people in New York, and I'm, this is New York, I'm, the New York metropolitan area, who would decide they didn't need the paper anymore that, for the extra money. The national circulation never buzzed. You couldn't see a, a blip at all. And the reason for that, I think, was that the demographics of this paper are so fantastic, and the lack of competition for this paper in, in so many areas of national news, of culture, of science, was so great that, you know, people, you want another quarter? Fine. You want another dollar? Fine. And I think that's going to be true on the web as well over time. Um, <coughs> The latest thing they're doing, um, and this is being this is this has grown since I left, which is in, and Stewart left in December. One of the trends that was bothering them was over time the home page of the paper. That's what you get when you click on the web and go to nytimes.com and you see what amounts to the front page as you would see in a newspaper. That has been in decline. Far more people come to time stories now from other sources, from Facebook, from the aggregators, you know, like Yahoo News. And they, they've been flustered about what to do about that. Now they're trying, they're really pushing on social media. They're hiring people who, you know, know how to develop audiences. There are signs they're succeeding, and they're very pleased with this. Um, it's, you know, social media, I'm on it a little bit, but not very much. And it's still strange to me, as I suspect it is to many of you. But the time itself, you know, I think endures. Um, the public editor had a piece just today, in fact. I didn't, I didn't see it until today, Stuart brought it. <laughs> um, pointing out that, um, um, you know, forecasting that the, the print edition will be here for a long time. And I think it will. There's a lot of people who love it. Um, it's become a very expensive thing, and that doesn't... And, and the circulation is declining. There's no question about that. Last number I saw was 600-odd thousand copies a day. This is down from over 900,000 not that long ago. Uh, Sunday paper circulation seems to be holding up quite well, which, which is an interesting yeah. phenomenon. Um... Anyway, I, I, think, I, I think there's a bright future of it. We have a situation where we have more demand for what we do than ever. What we are struggling to do is to find a way to monetize that demand. Sometimes people don't monetize demand. During my lifetime, I don't think there is any industry that existed when I was born and has grown more during my lifetime than airlines. And over that entire period, the airline industry is basically broken even. Um, you know, so demand is not the only thing in the world, but I think we'll find a way to monetize it. We have a great advantage over the record industry, which, as you know, is, has been 
devastated. And that advantage is that records last longer. <coughs> this week's top 40, and I couldn't tell you a single song on it, but I'll, <laughs> this week's top 40 is not very different from last week's top 40. And some songs on it have probably been there for a couple of months. Today's newspaper is completely different from yesterday's. It's a lot harder to steal all that if you want to keep up. you got to keep doing it so much more frequently. <laughs> and again, the people who most value it tend to be people with money. So I think that, um, you know, I, so I think there's a good feature. I mean, that's my pitch for why you should buy time stock, but you probably should ignore that. <laughs> and that's, you're, you're allowed to do that. Thanks. Um, that's, Floyd's starting to get into a little why we thought this would be a great idea to have this panel. Um, because as, as you're very aware, and he just pointed out, you know, the, in the United States in particular, the, the newspaper industry is under duress. It's not in, in the bulk of the world under duress, but it is in the United States and, and local newspapers as well as national. The local newspapers are under duress in part because the business model of local advertising uh, and classified has, has, has been usurped by Craigslist and eBay and Google and, and, and on and on and on. And just about anybody who wants to set up their own website and, and, and do local advertising. And so one of the reasons we thought to put this panel together was to explore this through the eyes of uh, a really great paper that um, is, is struggling with it. The national papers in the United States have gotten into trouble more <laughs> due to not so much the loss of advertising, although that's part of it, but more because they became over leveraged uh, with, with using debt to expand or take over other, uh, other forms of, of um, reporting, entertainment, and information. What I think is kind of interesting, and I'm going to ask uh, the panel to talk a little bit, uh, you know, Floyd started it, uh, looking at some things that the New York Times is doing. But I think it's very interesting that last year in Europe, uh, the amount spent on advertising was equal to the amount spent th that consumers spent directly on content. That is equal. So that it suggests that the model to support entertainment, information, uh, and so on does not always have to be exclusively advertising based. There's other ways to do it. And obviously, newspapers for forever and ever had purchase prices of subscription. And, and also, as well, advertising. But it's, it's all changing. There's other ways now to monetize things and get things to people and allow people to get things to them. So I'm going to return to uh, Stuart and ask him sort of the top of mind some of the things that the New York Times was doing in the last four or five years that had a positive effect, or maybe not such a positive effect, but at least in Stuart's eyes, and then I'll do the same with Andy and Floyd, is, you know, does it have some learning to it? And then we'll, as I said, conclude thinking a little more about, about the future. So, Stuart, do you mind? Um, the, the model that uh, the New York Times had been, and other newspapers, and traditional media companies had been pursuing was pretty much uh, about 100, maybe 125 years old. Uh, it was sort of a shift from the days when the newspapers in America were intensely partisan and political, and you bought your newspaper based on what political party it supported. Uh, the rise of the department store and the penny press led to the idea of the mass media and these giant advertisers, the big department stores in the big cities, and then the growth of giant national uh, consumer product companies like Wrigley and Coca-Cola and uh, Jell-O and so on and so forth. The idea was they wanted mass audiences and the 
idea was that they didn't want the newspaper to offend anybody. They wanted the newspaper to deliver the largest audience possible, which the newspaper found that they could do by becoming objective, maybe having opinions, confining them to the editorial pages, and then having the news be reported fairly and objectively to aggregate the most audience, the largest audience as possible, <laughs> which you could then deliver to these advertisers. And that went from newspapers to magazines to radio and to television all the way through most of the 20th century. Uh, the money that was, uh, that newspapers derived from circulation from the readers was relatively small. Uh, there may be people in this audience who remember the days when the New York Daily News or the New York Times uh, were two cents or five cents or 10 cents, 15 cents a copy. And uh, uh, that went on for decades. Uh, the changes that started to come were, uh, began when advertising, the advertising model was uh, messed up by the, by the internet. Uh, the bulk of the advertising revenue for all the media in this country, excuse me, the bulk of the revenue for all the media in this country was from advertising. Uh, 75% of a newspaper's revenue would be from advertising or more. The, uh, the money that newspapers in major markets and even in small communities would make from, say, classified advertising was absolutely, the profit margins could not be, uh, those profit margins were a, insane. There weren't, there weren't companies in this country like the airline industry, like Floyd mentioned, which barely breaks even uh, on a good year. Uh, newspapers were making, what, 40% profit margins yeah. back, uh, back then from their, uh, in local communities, from the monopoly uh, ability to monopolize the local advertising market. The internet disintermediated all of this and everything started to break down. Now the model has shifted to trying to get the bulk of the advertise of the, excuse me, the bulk of the revenue for legacy media companies from the reader, from the subscriber. As Floyd mentioned, the New York Times started charging for online content for the website. So did uh, a number of other newspapers. Uh, two or three years ago, the New York Times passed a milestone. The majority of revenue for the New York Times is now comes from you, the reader, and not from the advertiser. Part of that has to do with the uh, slow motion collapse of print advertising, which has been, uh, uh, those of you who see the uh, print edition of Sunday paper, the main section wasn't that many years ago where the main section would be a big fat thing, and then at Christmas time, there would be two and three sections of the main section. Uh, today's paper, I think the main section was maybe 24 pages, and I've seen it less. Uh, I think there was a Sunday not long ago with a Sunday style section with all of its fashion advertising actually exceeded the size of the main news section of the Sunday paper. So you're having that problem with advertising and print. It's now started to affect the, uh, some of the newspapers online, some of the print media online. The banner ad, which at the, t at the beginning of uh, 10 years ago, was uh, 20 years ago, was a novelty. People would click on them. They had some utility or some value. They're pretty much worthless now. They don't get any advertising revenue from banner ads is negligible. Media companies have to come up with new and different ways to get advertising revenue online. A lot of the uh, video, if you watch video online now, you'll see in most cases there's a commercial that uh, runs before the video, what's called pre-roll. It's a commercial you can't avoid or ignore, <laughs> usually. Sometimes you can skip it, but a lot of times you can't. That's an effort for these uh, media companies to try to raise revenue online, which at one point seemed like it was going to be a great new source of revenue, and now uh, is, uh, has become challenged. So the New York Times, I guess some of these new products are uh, not only charging for the content on the website, not only continuing to raise the prices of print subscriptions and the uh, price per copy of the newspaper, but also trying to charge for some of these apps and some of the other things uh, that the New York Times and these other newspapers are trying to offer readers on online. 
<laughs> Great. Andy? So, uh, you know, I still, in all, I've now been associated with the Times, even now, through the time I, since I left, I still write on a contract for 20 years. So it's, it's two thirds of my journalism career. But I still feel like a newcomer, like I'm observing it. You know, when I go to the newsroom, I feel like, a, like I'm observing something as well as being a participant. And one of the things that I've seen that's really fascinating is, and this, this is, reflects what we're talking about here, uh, the pay, one of the things that got missed in the coverage of the buyout, this most recent buyout, was that the staff of the Times, the new staff of the Times, is as big as it's ever been. It's well, just, the total staff. Yeah, no, new staff as well. It's 1,300, 1300 people. But that, uh, the yeah. new staff now is defined to uh, include well, a lot a, of people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's there, we go, there, there we go. Think are new but, staff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But that, yeah. that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. The news, uh, <laughs> this is why I still teach young kids and still can say there's jobs for you. Um, the news staff is people who are editing video. It's people who are creating infographics. It's people who know how know social media and can get eyeballs onto stories. Uh, I, I was in the newsroom with my students from Pace University on turn. It was um, election night several years ago, and uh, they, it was the first time I saw this. There was a pod at the Times. Pods are those like clusters that was all people tracking social media and tweeting out Times content in ways that would be, be sticky. That would be out there and. Uh, catching hold. Uh, what's what are people searching for right now? And and so so what, what I was saying a minute ago. There's still from what that article, the, the, the Times covered said there were two thirteen hundred people in that newsroom. Not a, but they're mostly not reporters. They're now people creating all these other things. And if you, I was in the Times another time. There's a floor. There's a section where they do training, and there were all these you know sort of hipster Brooklynite Beaconite kind of kids with black rim glasses and. And devices, and although actually it's funny, you know, these young, these young digital natives always have some kind of cool like pad. Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> but it's, uh, at any rate, it's the it, what it's becoming less is uh, an authored report than a mediated filter of what is happening around the world. The thing that's going away from the newspaper is the word news. You, you're not gonna. The Times will not sustain itself economically by chasing news because we all know what's going on right now. You know it through some device, through some feed, whether it's the New York Times or The Guardian or CBS's website or CNN, you don't really know that anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's never going to be monetized to, me, to, my, to my mind. What you will monetize is a portal that you know, whether you're tracking finance or climate change debate, or whatever that's got a sense of an overarching sense of authority and the the model that I've talked about before is the old reporter was was really somewhat stenographic you've probably heard about this idea that we're you know covering the White House or whatever uh, but now it's more like being a, as I say it's like being a mountain guide after an avalanche the, the reporter of the 21st century and the medium of the 21st century that will thrive will be some place where you know in a complicated information environment you can go to get some sense of what's actually going on. And I, if you can create that aura, you'll get people paying for that, for that privilege of, of having that. Uh, if, if you're thinking you're going to be chasing the news, uh, forget about it. It's, it's, uh, to me, that's not sustainable. And I've been, you know, I, as a blogger, too, I'm always caught between what do I write about, you know, because it's 24-7. It's like running up an accelerating down escalator, being, bat <laughs> being battered by three or four fire hoses. That's the modern, you know, and, and that's not sustainable. So, so I'm trying to be more analytical myself. And I think the Times will, and this, keep in mind that the News Weekly magazines went through this evolution years ago, and now, of course, they're all going away. So I don't know, you know, they went from being a News Weekly to being much more analytical. Time magazine was writing these big features about what to think about fat, or now fat is good, fat is bad. You, you know, it, it's, a, it, it's still a very tough environment, but you will not thrive in this environment financially chasing news anymore, to me, to my mind. And I would be happy to have that disputed. Well, okay. I, I think I'd like to dispute it a little bit. I think that, I think that news remains vital. This is, um, you know, the news that you're getting, that everyone is getting, you know, punched at them on their phones if you've signed up for the right things, is coming from somewhere. Um, and it is coming from a relative handful of media that are still trying to cover news. Um, and that obviously includes the New York Times, it includes the Wall Street Journal, it includes a few of the, um, a, a number of other publications, it includes CNN, but not that many. 
when um, when Stewart was mentioning the um, the way American journalism had trended toward not offending, trying to be objective, we want everyone to read it. That was true of every little paper in the, or the vast majority of newspapers in the country. Um, most cities had become newspaper monopolies. One newspaper had all the business or virtually all the business. That was never true in Britain. And that was an interesting development. Today, there are quite a few daily newspapers in London which you can buy every, the same day virtually throughout the British Isles. Some of them don't make it to far northern Scotland, but that really, <laughs> that really doesn't matter unless you live in far northern Scotland. <laughs> And but they're so, succeeding anyhow. Well, some of them are succeeding. They never had news budgets like we did. They never spent money covering the news like we did. Um, but the way those papers differentiated themselves was basically in two ways. One was on the tabloid versus quality front, which we have to some extent in New York. But the second was political. And today, if you meet someone from England and find out that he or she only reads the, the Telegraph, you know they voted conservative in the last election. Mm -hmm. And if their neighbor only reads The Guardian, you know they voted Labor. That's all you need to know. Traditionally, finding out someone read The New York Times did not tell you what their politics were. Murdoch, who of course thrived and prospered in British journalism long before um, you know, long before he invaded America <laughs> um, and discovered he was an American citizen. Um, <laughs> Murdoch um, <laughs> understood this, I think, before most of us did. When he started Fox News, he chose the right. And he, then, he, then he added slogans like fair and balanced, which was wonderfully cynical. But, um, and I, I'm persuaded that if somebody else had seized the right before Murdoch did, he would have gone to the left. That's my belief. For the same reason that if you're starting a restaurant in a town with no fish restaurants, you might consider starting a fish restaurant. <laughs> um, not necessarily because you like fish, you think that might sell. Um, so anyway, that's, that's I think what has happened to journalism in this country. Murdoch is trying to turn the Wall Street Journal into an alternative to the Times, which much more, they used to be principally financial coverage. They're much more now. Um, and he's trying to develop a system where when you find out somebody reads the Wall Street Journal, you know they, they're conservatives, and when they read the New York Times, you know they're liberals. Um, we haven't gotten there completely yet. We're on that, on that course to some extent. Um, anyway, that's all I think that the, the, other, you know, the other thing about American newspapers is so many of them, the papers published by groups like Gannett, which has the local daily paper in the Hudson Valley, um, came to see themselves as advertising delivery vehicles. Mm. News was something they had to fill the holes with <laughs> and should do so at the lowest possible cost. Um, and it used to be I mean, if you lived in, in Detroit, where the free press circulated, if you wanted world and national news, the free press was probably where you got it. There was another competitor, another newspaper there, the Detroit News, one of them. Um, but of course, now, if you live in Detroit and you want world and national news, there's no particular reason to look at the Detroit paper or its website. You can access the New York Times or the Washington Post or the Guardian or whatever just as easily. And the chances are they know more about it. So that's been devastating to Metro papers. They should have a monopoly. They should have good coverage of their state. Many of them don't. And of course, they're stuck with lots of little localities, none of which they traditionally covered well. Then you come down to the level where the paper is at, philipstown.info. There is a community to cover. There is a local government to cover. And I think, th I think there's a business opportunity there. Um, because this is information that a small number of people care about, but they really care. And so I think that's, that, and, and there's not likely to be a lot of other alternative sources. In this town, of course, as, as you all know, we now have two alternative sources. 
which is very unusual in America. And it, it's, I'm fascinated by how that will play out, but that's another story. Speaking of which, Kevin Foley is here in the front yeah. row. Kevin is our editor of the paper and uh, phillipstown.info. And uh, <laughs> so, so thanks, for, thanks for giving him some advice. Right. Can, um, can I just, you I mentioned, I want to, I want uh, sure, sure. sure. Just, uh, just, I, was gonna, I want to give you an example. I'm sure a lot of you paid attention to this past winter. There's a huge entrepreneurial prospect that, that the internet has created. Hudson, how many of you track Hudson Valley weather, either on Facebook or their website? How, how many? Just raise your hands a little higher. That's pretty good. And Hudson Valley weather was created by like one, one or two meteorologists who found a way to build a, a successful model online. They also do commercial forecasting for commercial customers. Yeah, they But they, ha they have thousands yeah. of followers. And they filled a niche that's really important at the regional, local scale that I paid attention to religiously all winter, and I'm sure will, uh, you know, the hurricane yeah. season as well. So, so it's an interesting moment. Okay, well, we're going to transition quickly now into the future, even though they 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 hinted just a little bit. Uh, but you know, we we're we're talking about essentially disruption that that's occurred, uh, and. Um, one of the things that's really interesting to me is, for example, that the new owner of the Washington Post was the founder of Amazon, which disrupted uh, retail. And uh, so one of the questions is, can you always you know, be able to deal with disruption uh, from the inside? Or does it take some fresh thinking, some new ownership, some new ways to look at things from the outside? I remember when I took a course in systems thinking from Forrester at MIT, first thing he said to us was that the last to know that the river is polluted are the fish. And I thought, what, what the hell is he talking about? <laughs> and what his point was, because if you think in systems, the fish slowly get used to worse and worse pollution mm -hmm. until they die. Whereas if, you know, you were paying then attention. Then they don't know anything. What? Then they don't know anything. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's not, that's the problem, right? Then they don't know anything at, at all anymore. So I'm, I'm just going to throw it open to whoever wants to start on this thought about going, the New York Times <laughs> going forward. They've, they've initiated things not only on the digital side, but they've gotten into creating events. They've gotten into creating tours, uh, you know, guided tours for people. Um, and uh, as Andy said, he, he's part of the new product, creating the blog and, and more and, and more video. So guys, what are some of your thoughts about where they could go? Uh, I think you're all, in agreement saying they're probably going to survive for a while, but what are some new ideas, what are some thoughts about where they could go? Do they need a Jeff Bezos or...? Yeah. Well, I don't know about you guys. Do you remember right at that point when... Uh, the, who was the Mexican billionaire who bailed us out? Carlos Slim. Slim. Yeah, Carlos Slim. Slim. Somewhere in that Slim crisis era, there was a, everyone in the newsroom was really hoping Google was going to buy us. And, and I don't, I don't or know. Bloomberg. Yeah, or well, Bloomberg. <laughs> and, you know, it was like... It makes so much sense. They're making all this money using our content. Why don't they, of course, but that's backwards. They're not going to buy us because they don't need to buy us. I mean, but we wanted yeah. them to buy us. So I don't know, Floyd. I'm curious about that. Um, I, I, as it is, I'm not confident. Traditionally in, in disruption, the incumbent players are in trouble because they're hesitant to move for fear of hurting their existing business. And there's been some of that at the time, no question about it. There was a feeling that we don't want to put something up on the web too soon because we, you know, we shouldn't cheat our, our, our pay, our paying, paper subscribers. That feeling went away. <laughs> um, you know, it's um, whether Bezos is good news or not. There's there's another thing we've seen in newspaper ownership in recent years, which has always been there, which is newspaper ownership for prestige and power. Um, now, Bezos may succeed. I don't know Bezos. I don't know his motivations. But if you'd like everyone in Washington to pay attention to you and listen to what you say, 
owning the Washington Post <laughs> would not be a bad strategy. <laughs> um, and you know, it, it you know, it's, it, it, of course, there's financial issues there too. You know, we saw this in Philadelphia. It was extremely sad when when the Philadelphia Inquirer and Daily News were sold a few years ago. They went to a bunch of local businessmen who had no idea what they were doing, but they thought it was really great to be the big guys in town. Mm -hmm. And they completely mismanaged it. Um, in a very challenging environment. I mean, you know, we're not, you know, we're not talking a business, like, you know, the equivalent of having a monopoly on ice cream during the summer. You know, you, 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 may, you don't have to be good to make money. But they, they, they did it very badly. I, you know, I think quality journalism is still going to prevail. Over time, you're right about, I disagree with Andy on, on news, but it's certainly true the actual event, I mean, I assume there's nobody in America who found out that Barack Obama was elected president from the New York Times. Mm -hmm. um, somebody might have found out about it from our website. A few probably did. But um, on the other hand, we sold a zillion papers the next day because people wanted analysis of what it meant. They want under, they wanted understanding of the election. And that that continues. You know, obviously, you know, the fact that um, Hurricane Sandy hit New York a couple of years ago now, you know, nobody found out about that from picking up the New York Times. But they we they still wanted to read it. And I think there's a lot of opportunity for us there. How we're going to handle it, how they're going to handle it, I don't know. There's a lot of flailing about and hopeful and hoping. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, to use an advertising cliche, you know, throw it on the wall and see, see what if it sticks. sticks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, and I, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. And, and the, the, the opportunities that are, that are made available now for niche content, like you said, Hudson Valley weather and some of these other things, you can now find that if you are, if you have a fascination with, 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 if you're a left-handed bowler and you want to find out more about how other left-handed bowlers deal with the challenge of being a left-handed bowler, you, there's probably 50 different blogs and websites online where you could get that information. And if you're that interested in it, there may be a point where you're willing to pay for that or to go to an event or to uh, watch a video that uh, has a sponsor to it or whatever. So the internet, the new media, at the same time that they're hacking the old media to death, like Freddy in one of those horror movies, um, there's, there's opportunities that are being created also. But like you said, it's a lot of flailing around to try to figure out how to make money on it, how to do it in a way that stands out from everyone else who's trying to do it at the same time, and then how to keep your, uh, for the legacy media companies, how to keep the perception that you're not abandoning your core base original readers and advertisers. I mean, that's the thing with the Times. This article today in the uh, uh, Sunday Review about the, uh, the print edition, 70% of the revenue from the newspaper is still derived in some way from the print edition, which, was, it's, which is an amazing uh, number. But... Um, and there is a perception that as the New York Times continues to try to figure out how to improve what it does online and on smartphones and other mobile devices, that it's somehow giving the print edition a short shrift. Uh, there was a considerable uh, brouhaha recently when the home section was discontinued uh, in print and obviously also <coughs> online after, what, 30 years, 35 years? Uh, the Sunday auto section uh, was discontinued. There's now two-thirds of a page on Fridays that sort of uh, uh, replaces it. Uh, and when I left the paper, uh, they discontinued the advertising column, which would have celebrated its uh, 80th anniversary this year. It ain't there no more. If you wanted it, if you got used to seeing that in print and also online, Monday through Friday, it's not there. Uh, so <laughs> you're beginning to get into issues now where uh, choices are being made in terms of where to focus resources, scarcer resources, and as you bring in these younger people who are skilled in video production and audience development, that may mean that people like Floyd and myself and some other folks who left, uh, who had 
expertise built up over many years in certain coverage areas, uh, those areas won't be covered or won't be covered as much or the same or the same as way well, or, or as well. well. Yeah. Right. No, I, th this is the you know this is the key issue is there are things like Matt Wall took the buyout. Matt Wall has written about energy for thir thirty years, energy and aviation, all these issues in there. You know there are creditable people who will take his place the paper, but you do lose. What, what the Times has lost in these past few years in terms of people like the people around me here uh, is a sense of continuity and understanding of the bigger forces in these industries or, or sectors or subjects. And that, that is an issue that uh, I am not confident that the Times has the capacity to internally innovate at the state, the rate you would need to uh, sustain. Well, I could see it. I think the budget is going to keep going down. I used to think, I had a discussion with Bill Keller uh, <laughs> Uh, in 2000, January 2009, at a dinner when they were creating the green green desk, uh, we sat in a corner, and I, I I predicted that the staff within 10 years would be more like 600 instead of 1,200. I was wrong, as I just said. It's actually as big as ever, but the budget is shrinking, and the staff are now young, underpaid, overworked, uh, you know, uh, Twitter Twitter uh, managers. Um, I see that trend continuing. There are certain core capacities at the Times that will be around for, for, for generations to come. Investigative reporting is going to be the core thing. Uh, analytical expertise, and those will be the things that will sustain a business model, but it'll be much more like the New Yorker than the New York Times we know now. Everything else is going to get w w nibbled away, and not necessarily in a bad way. As I said, Hunts, you know, I don't go to the New York Times for my weather. The Times has resisted having weather coverage. They don't have anyone... I got an email from a senior editor at the Times uh, during one of the big blizzards. Uh, who's a good blogger that we could get here? <laughs> uh, uh, you know, and I gave them some names, and it's months later, and they still the Times has not created a weather blog. The New York, the Washington Post has a very good weather blog. Hmm. Yeah. So, so it's that's going to continue. It's not. I'm not encouraged. I, you know, I'm encouraged that the core capacity of the Times will not be de degraded, but I'm not encouraged that the business of the Times will will be sustained in a big way. That's great. Uh, I'm going to open it up to you uh, to take advantage of this great opportunity of these terrific people. My own thought is that I think the advertising part um, is, is likely to shift. Uh, I'm not predicting exactly how, but in my class at Columbia, I, I teach the students that marketing and advertising is a lot like watching third graders play soccer. Have you ever noticed? The ball goes over here, and all the kids run over there. The ball goes over, they all run over here. As Stuart said, you know, uh, eight years ago, the, the savior of advertising was banner ads, you know, these stupid little things that at most put a brand name out there in front of a, a consumer. So I think it, there's, there's the real possibility that advertising is going to return, uh, maybe not to completely to the printed version, but to the content they're talking about, content that matters, and, and figuring that out. Mm. So I, I, I think it's going to go for a balance. Uh, who would like to begin? Uh, wow, way in the back. All right, you got your hand up first. <laughs> You, you can either direct it to the whole panel or to one, one of the individuals. Well, any of the panels. Okay. You know, if, if access to information is such a key cornerstone of democracy, I was just wondering if you have anything to say. Are we it's also such a complex issue, and there's so much that could be done with democracy, or is it irrelevant? <laughs> I have lots of thoughts on that. But. Uh, I'll just say briefly uh, it, it's a mix. You know, obviously, like everything. Uh, there's too much information, first of all. Um, the internet, which theoretically uh, connects everyone, has this amazing capacity to divide everyone because we all go into our bubbles. There's a really good book on this, The Filter Bubble, which says <laughs> they basically your, your friends on Facebook are mostly probably like you because that's why you're... And so it if you don't us. work as a consumer of information, if you don't work to get outside your bubble... You could live in a very vulnerable place in the end because it'll just keep bubbling until it pops. Um, so, so, so that's a problem. Uh, the solutions are that the internet is enforcing transparency in ways that have never been as efficient as possible. Uh, palm oil, the palm oil in your Kit Kat bar, 
uh, because of groups like Greenpeace, I don't agree with everything Greenpeace does, but they've made it possible now. They've pressured companies like Nestle to change where they get palm oil by doing clever YouTube campaigns <coughs> that, that say the, to consumers, when you bite into a Kit Kat bar, you're killing an orangutan. Unless the company is getting responsible about where its palm oil comes from that gives that kit chocolate that good quality. So the, the transparency, and of course Wiki, WikiLeaks and, and everything else like that is another aspect of that. That is enforcing, perhaps, uh, not necessarily democracy, but openness to informa of information in a way that was never there uh, before. Well, uh, the, the contrary to that, of course, is that not that long ago, the vast majority of people had to depend on what came to be called the mainstream media, which were trying to play it down the middle. And to some people, that middle was a horrible place. Um, and doing it sometimes better than others. That's no longer true. Um, you can now depend on a source you already agree with for most of the information that will filter the information to make it show that you were right to begin with. <laughs> right. You can even yeah. sign up for it. And make sure that's all you get. And, you know, the there was a wonderful poll some years ago um, that um, showed that a majority of people who watched Fox News believed that weapons of mass destruction had been found in Iraq. <laughs> Not that they would be, but they were <laughs> found. Fact. And, you know, this drove some mainstream journalists crazy. Um, and I think that's, I think that's a real threat. Um, many people now dismiss certain media, as I tend to dismiss Fox News, as being unreliable. I know people in the Midwest who I sort of know because they're relatives of relatives and all that kind of stuff. And I see them at some big party <laughs> gathering once every decade or so. Many years ago, they thought I worked for a great newspaper they never read. In more recent years, they thought I worked for a lying left-wing rag they never read. <laughs> and, you know, I didn't change jobs during that period. <laughs> the, um, and I think that's an incredible threat. Sometimes you'll see people, you know, politicians who've just been nailed by some publication, dismissing it as... Um, you know, just propaganda from the other side, and their followers may believe it, and I think that's disturbing. Stuart, you have anything to, no, no, okay. Mike? Um, well, I wonder if you could comment a little bit on the, on the future of the profession of journalists. Uh, the journalist profession as, as the writers and editors? Yes. function of the journalist as the investigator and collator of information. Uh, so I'm just wondering where, you know, and also given how much information is passed around by people who are not journalists, uh, you know, blog, well, bloggers, I mean, uh, you know, what sort of credential do they have or, or people who, you know, tweet, you know, compulsively, you know, wherever they get their information. So, I'm one of them. <laughs> so how do you see yourself, you know, the next generation of you? Well, Greenpeace has journalists on staff. They, they have investigative journalists. I mean, all well, the they, environmental groups. Well, they, but they're, they're not journalists. Or they're, or they're activists. A classic, they're activists. A classic example just happened in the New York Times. There was a page one very widely cited article in the New York Times a few weeks ago about um, the revelations and documents showing that a climate scientist named Willie Soon uh, was paid, his budget came from coal company, and um, um, that came through a Greenpeace Freedom of Information request that then the Times had an agreement with Greenpeace to, with the Guardian, also in England, to sort of exclusively reveal this. And that is, you're going to see more and more of that kind of thing. Um, that's what I was talking about earlier, that the transparency is there for anybody. Um, and I agree with you, Mike, that uh, if newspaper, newspapers are not aware of that reality, they're going to miss the boat. Remember, the whole WikiLeaks uh, and what's his name? Uh, I'm blanking. The guy. Julian. In, no, no. The NSA. Uh, uh, Snowden. Yeah, Snowden. He, he, all of those revelations were were this hybrid 
between him giving the newspapers this stuff and the newspapers writing on it. It wasn't like some some gumshoe reporter anymore going out there and digging and digging and digging. It's kind of a weird environment now. So what do well, you think, Andy? What, what do you think, Floyd? Uh, well, I was just saying, well, to be fair, I mean, Pentagon Papers weren't some gumshoe reporter going out there either. They That's were right. an insider leaking stuff. Right. At a time when getting access to a Xerox machine to, 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 to copy, you know, many papers was a challenge for him. Right. I mean, the stories about that talk about Xerox machines and, you know, using them. And obviously, that's gone now. You can, you know, you have, you have the capacity at home, technology at home, to scan a piece of paper if you got your hands on the paper and have it available to everyone in the world half an hour later. Um, this has changed many things. I, you know, I, I look at demand for journalism, and I think it's going to persist. Young people I know who want to be journalists report to me that there is apparently an unequaled list of opportunities where they can do it, because there are so dang many websites, most of which I've never heard of, many of which will fail, um, but at least for the time being, they exist. Um, of course, they don't pay well. Some of them don't pay at all. Um, and, but as people, we all know that beginning journalism jobs, when we were getting beginning journalism jobs, were not very well paid. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, so in that sense, it hasn't changed. I don't know the future of journalism. I'm, I'm not at all sure that if I somehow could become 18 again, I'd choose to do it again. Yeah, one of the big one of the big issues I think that uh, that uh, everybody is struggling with is the idea that the the definition of news is changing, and there are now lucrative opportunities for people who, in the old days, when they got out of journalism school, would have gone to work for a newspaper or most most likely a small local area newspaper. Uh, they can now go to work for uh, a consumer market or public relations agency or an ad agency, or an actual uh, brand, uh, a corporation, a consumer marketer themselves, who have what they call now news desks and newsrooms that are charged with putting out information on the, pr primarily on social media platforms like Twitter and Facebook. Um, and obviously, a lot of that stuff is not, it's news in the sense that you didn't know it, but it has a, a, a <laughs> I didn't know that. Uh, but it has it has a slant and a point of view and a sponsor behind it. Um, it and, and that I think is a, that's become increasingly because as Floyd said, it never when you when you I mean journalism was a calling uh, more than a career uh, given some of the salaries that uh, they used to pay and probably still pay to this day. So now the temptation is even more so to uh, to uh, to go to work for uh, for uh, for Satan or whatever the man or uh, the, the 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 was it church and state to go to work for a state I guess so. Um. Robin. Well, doesn't that it sort of pave the way for what your role should be or the paper should be? When well, you talked about the paper to be the authority. You can get information. Most of it is inaccurate. You have absolutely no idea. I have no idea who, was, who writes for the Daily Beast, whether I should read the Daily Beast, whether what they say is responsible. And shouldn't this be the role of some entity like, maybe not the New York Times, but somebody's got to be able to be that authority to, to think about it. And one of the things that I think, I, I grew up loving the New York Times, I've always loved the New York Times, except I'll tell you, it failed me terribly when it came to the Iraq War, and the build up to the Iraq War. And now you're telling me that they were flush with money. What went on there? I mean, what we really need is some journalistic entity, or whatever the new model would be, is to be able to help the thinking person to know not just what the right's saying, but what the left is saying. And, 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 both, and, and a thinking person may want to know both points of view, but at least to say, I'm getting those both points of view from some authoritative body. Well, there, there, there are innovations that are they're like this. So the Washington Post has a really good column. I think it's called Fact Check, 
where they hand out yes. Pino- they yes. hand out Pinocchios like mm-hmm. like they they they, qu- they have a hit team that when Obama says something or or uh, Bollard says something they they jump in uh, Boehner I mean they jump in and they quickly uh, assess you know how true it is and that is the kind of tool I think that shows actually the Washington Post is way ahead of us the Times on that kind of thing because you, they're immediately giving you a sense okay well these if you really want to know what's true about the latest question check out what they say on that column. But, and so that's where the innovation can come from that can make um, entities like the Times or the Washington Post trustworthy in a place you want to go when there's something that's contentious and out there. By the way, the other thing is we're in an environment now, a media environment, where, where the, the entity is you, the readers. Um, we have to change how we teach. Uh, one reason I'm in academia is like, you know, I got... <laughs> understanding the media process enough to know, oh boy, do I really want to do this for the next 20 years, knowing that people just go out there and take the information they want that, about global warming or whatever. Um, there, uh, Stony Brook has a really good uh, undergraduate uh, uh, course in news literacy. In other words, how to navigate this environment yourself as a consumer of news. The consumer of news has to do more work. Uh, the video someone just posted on Facebook of the, some wacky scene you know, with a cow and a, and a cat, uh, is, was it real? Snopes.com is this uh, group, crowd-mediated thing that immediately tells you what's real or not re- in an image or something you've seen online. But if you don't know Snopes.com exists, you don't know that. So, so we have to teach uh, the new generation of news consumers in the 21st century, especially kids from, I'm talking about grade school onward, they need to have some training in how to navigate this arena. Don't rely on some big entity to do it. Walter Cronkite isn't out there anymore to say that's the way it is. I, I mean, I get this speech all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And because that's what led us into the Iraq war. Everyone assumed, well, the New York Times is saying it, therefore it must be true. Yeah. That's the way it is. It's not always the case anymore. So the, in a complex environment, you need to have that crowd capacity to, including from the reader's end, uh, what's real or not. And, and some people are suggesting that the this sort of traditional parochialism uh, that news media have uh, be be changed or re, rethought the idea that if you're reading the New York Times if you're on the New York Times website uh, the New York Times is the be all and end all of all sourcing and and knowledge uh, there's some some news media now are trying to do uh, they send you they'll send you to another website mm-hmm. if they're doing an article on this subject right. they will reference other <laughs> websites oh you might want to read this story on this website you might want to read this blog post it's related or here's an opinion that we have but here's a different opinion on it mm-hmm. so somehow to take down the walls and make the you know assume that if somebody is interested in a subject or a topic or uh, something they want to learn more assume that they're that they you know trust them enough to go away, send them away to someplace else, and they might appreciate that and come back to you uh, with a more, uh, more respect for you, uh, respecting their intellect. But uh, now so much of this stuff is unverifiable, and people just want to read what they already believe. They just want their opinion reinforced and makes it challenging. So you need a just to reinforce more what, what what's <clears throat> Stuart just said, I, I did a study a year ago with Peter Senge at, at, at MIT looking at the sources of, of trust on, on the internet. And, and the number one indicator was openness. The willingness to open up, put it all out there, <laughs> allow you to ask questions, link with other sources. And the second was the brand's name. So, uh, you know, when you say, Robin, that, that you began to lose some trust in the brand name, that's a danger signal for anyone in the media and, and, and in the news uh, business. Yes, yeah, Elizabeth? I have a question with regard to the paper, our local, yeah. the second paper. And that is, I'm wondering how many free local papers you think there are in the United States and who <coughs> pays for them? Is it the, more the advertising? I was wondering, mm-hmm. even like, AM New York and the Metro, who pays for that free newspaper that now, if you're on the subway in the morning, most everybody's sort of looking at it. Uh, Can you repeat the question? Yeah, the, the, the question the, was the about. The question was uh, the paper and philiptown.info locally are free. How many are like that around the country? And she was referring to the Metro and AM uh, in, in New York, the little tiny thin daily. Uh, full of stuff, two thirds of which are ads. Uh, 
but uh, but but it's free. And it, that's your question. Yeah, I, yeah, I, who pays for it? Yeah, advertisers yeah. pay for those. That's sort of more like the traditional model where you're going back to getting the advertisers to pay, and then you charge very little or nothing for each individual copy on the on the on the hope that you're giving the audi the advertiser a big enough audience to make what they spend on those ads worthwhile. And then some people are doing a hybrid where they're doing like a membership model. Where there was a one point where the New York Times was during during the struggles that the New York Times was undergoing during the financial crisis, there was a suggestion that rather than go to Carlos Slim or 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 someone like that, that the Times should should become a nonprofit and and become reader supported and uh, like p pledge drives on PBS <laughs> and uh, you know the New York Times would spare you those. Uh, those uh, those earnest pitches that you have to sit through when you're watching Channel 13 or Channel uh, 21, but uh, some form of that was suggested. Uh, uh, and I guess is there is there somebody who's a, a foundation? Is some paper St. Well, Petersburg paper, owned by a foundation? St. Petersburg, Petersburg paper now called the Tampa Bay Times yeah. is owned by a foundation. Um, Phillipstown.info is as you many of you know has become, is following the NPR model. You are urged to give money to it. If not enough people do give money to it, it will go away. Um, the ads aren't paying, you know, don't pay for most of the publication. Um, you know, it's gonna be interesting to see if that can be made to work. I mean, it can be made to work to some extent. NPR, obviously, you can listen to for free. You know, nobody's, you can turn on your radio and listen to WNYC all day if you want to, and you you may have to endure the pledge drive, but you don't have to respond to it. Um, and and yet that has been a reasonably successful model. People do care. Yeah, we were getting at the times. I was told when things were really bad, people were sending in checks as donations. The paper had no idea how to deal with that. <laughs> <laughs> it was. You know, the management, you know, was, was offended by it. And I think they ended up taking the money and, and putting it into the Newspaper and Education Fund, which subsidizes papers on college campuses. They couldn't bear to just deposit it in the bank. They just, it, it, it just ran the wrong way. That might change, too. I don't know. But anyway. well, Elizabeth, around the country, a number of others are similar to the model we have here now, Gordon Stewart's vision. Uh, they're often primarily supported by some kind of foundation like uh, Floyd was talking to and a little bit by advertising but but again most of it is reader or members supported uh, uh, because even when you think of NPR uh, they do have those weak uh, drives but during the regular broadcast they'll say with their own voice a voice from their station but something about a foundation or yeah. so and so is given money. Yeah. So uh, they really are advertisements, and sometimes they'll say yeah. things that I think is probably a lot cheaper than a paid advertisement because everybody's listening. Yeah. But I was just wondering here what maybe we could do. And so you think it's more private support than that would work here? Well, there's also now the very popular model online, which is called crowdsourcing, yeah, where right. you go, you you right. ask you ask the people, the seven billion people of the world, to <laughs> right. to or kickstart it. You know, you ask right. the seven billion people of the world to help you record your album or send you and your class on the trip to the North Pole to right. to measure the the effects of global climate change on polar bears or or uh, asking people to uh, you have your your child that's suffering from a, a rare disease and needs an operation and you want the money or or to to the, any of any innumerable causes or or commercial enterprises and this fundraising this commercial uh, this fundraising model by asking the crowd to to help is is uh, proving successful in many cases. So, uh, you know, it probably won't be long before we see uh, legitimate news organizations uh, with their uh, holding out the tin cup online and uh, asking for crowd uh, crowdsourced uh, funding. We have time for one more question, and then we have refreshments. Uh, we'll be in the back room. You'll have a chance to pigeonhole these terrific guys. Uh, yes. Um, I'm curious from your point of view as reporters who started reporting when news was very different, 
Um, and I feel like my generation is sort of pushing along a way of reading news that is uh, very selective and very widespread um, and probably free, but that that's not necessarily the way news should be. And so for the Times or any other news source to find the balance between keeping up with the way things are changing, um, but maybe holding out because it's actually better the way it was. Um, does that make sense? It's, it we're going through an epic. Yeah, it, it, well, the question was about how, this is uh, Ava, who's a very young news consumer, maybe the youngest co news consumer in the room. And, and, uh, and uh, that, I think that's true. Uh, and, uh, you know, so us who started, and, you know, I brought, a, I brought an art, you know, artifact. Like, for those who haven't seen it. You, you millions know, on eBay. So what do we think about how this is going to play out? And it's going to be ugly, and it's going to be complicated, and very, as Floyd says, I don't think anyone can predict um, the consequences. It's We're at a moment that's very Gutenberg-like in the sense of, um, <laughs> you know, and that was when someone owned knowledge. It was, it, it was owned, and then the printing press made, made it so much more available, and then mass production, mass media made it so much more available. It was no longer monetizable. And the, the professor, I learned about the professor standing at the lectern. You know, he owned the information, and all the students were writing down. That's all going away. By the way, academia is going through the same epic transition. Oh, it's even Campuses. worse. It's you know, how do you support worse. a how do you support the fifty thousand dollar a year sales price when when my son got his job in the movie business by learning something on YouTube? How to use a certain piece of software? Yeah, ma the mass mocha, the mass online free courses. It, yeah. Turned academia. So it's no one knows the answer to your question. It's an uncomfortable situation for those of us who grew up in the in the twenty first what, twentieth century. What is, you know, change comes in in big doses and then it goes a long time with little change. I went to college on my mother on the typewriter my mother went to college on. If I suggested to my son he should have a five-year-old laptop at college, I'm sure there would have been. <laughs> um, we're, you know, it's um, and the Gutenberg thing, you know, he, he has brought up Gutenberg. You know the Gutenberg Bible and all that. That created that helped to create the revolution of the Catholic Church because suddenly people were suggesting that everybody should be able to read the Bible. Well, you know that meant that you had to let them read parts of the Bible that didn't necessarily seem to in be interpreted the same way that the Pope thought they should be interpreted, and that wasn't a good idea. Um, and then it settled down, obviously. Um, I think this will settle down. I suspect you will see it settle down. I don't think I will, just in terms of lifespan. And I think that's one of the big, one of the big challenges now, and that's driving everyone in, in positions of power crazy, is that the pace of change is is almost continuous. I mean, you have like, for instance, uh, something like Twitter uh, or Facebook, which are relatively new yet are being treated now by advertisers and marketers, not that different from NBC News or yeah. Time Magazine yeah. Yeah. or, or the, the New York Times or... Uh, and they're asking for the same accountability. And they're asking, and they're asking... You know, and, do you and, work? And uh, um, I don't, I, I think that, uh, I think that there's more change out there and uh, this keeps getting, it keeps knocking people off, off their, uh, off their perches and sometimes that's good. But I think a lot of it is, is that just the, the, uh, the amazing pace of it now. I mean, the idea that the, 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 the traditional media companies were struggling and they finally got online and they finally got decent websites and so on and so forth. And then the devices came along oh, yeah. and now most of the traffic to the New York Times doesn't come from laptops or desktop. It comes from phones and, and other smart devices, which requires an entirely different way of presenting <laughs> the content yeah. to all these people. And, uh, and, uh, that, I think, is part of the challenge that makes it exciting, also makes it very terrifying that uh, I think that uh, it just keeps uh, happening in these new devices and new technologies. The, the, the watches, the smart watches, the Apple Watch, is that going to be some massive change or is it just going to be a fad? We don't know. We'll find out in a month when it comes out, but uh, that possibly could potentially revolutionize everything we've been talking about. Uh, wearable devices, if that catches on, uh, that could be the next revolution. So uh, uh, it's a very exciting time, and uh, 
It's a time that uh, people are more open, uh, people in position of power are more open, I think, to listening to uh, ideas that young people have and that outsiders have. Uh, uh, the question, of course, is whether they're going to uh, solve, uh, solve, for the, uh, solve the problem. And uh, the other thing is there, I don't think, I don't think you, would, you guys would agree, there isn't a single media company out there or medium out there that is getting it, is successful, has jumped the hurdle and has, has, has leaped over the fence and is doing it right and, uh, and has secured their future in this new world we live in. I don't think, could you point to anybody that you could say they, they got it, they get it, they did it, they're doing it? I'm not, sure, I'm not sure there's an it to get yet. Yeah, that's, the, yeah, that's yeah, part yeah. of it, yes, and exactly. That's part yeah. of the problem, or, or the opportunity. Um, I mean, as you were talking, it just occurred to me that when I was young, I don't think there were any major companies in this country, you know, the places that were worth a lot, that had been created in the last couple of decades. And now many of our, many of the most valuable companies in the country have been created you know, in some cases, in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. And that's amazing. Um, and, you know, as I said, that will salt, that will cool down eventually. It reminds me of the radio revolution in, in the 20s, um, which became the huge fad. That's the fad that helped to create Wall Street having such wonderful valuations in 1929. <laughs> and, um, you know... <laughs> The forecasts then were absolutely accurate, but they were premature. The same was through in, in 1999 when we had the tech craze. You know, eventually, I think change will slow down, but we're not there yet. And there, there's supposed to be, I've, I've since, I've read that it's not really a Chinese curse. May you live in interesting times. Um, but it should be. <laughs> and, um, you know, we're in interesting times. Thank you guys so much.